My name's Dick Hobbs. I'm a writer and commentator about this industry, have been since before there was an industry. And in, um, I think it was 2006, I made a podcast saying podcasts are the future of marketing communications. Um, they weren't then. I suspect that was a failing of my skills in marketing communications. Um, so it's probably time to talk to an expert. And there is no better expert than Alex Jungis. Alex is from a company called This Is Distorted, based in the beautiful city of Leeds, and they specialize in making podcasts. So, Alex. Hello. How did you get <laughs> here, and how did you find yourself making podcasts? Yes. Uh, firstly, thank you. Uh, whether I'm the, uh, the, the font of all knowledge on podcasts, uh, who, who, who can say? But... Yeah, so my background is in radio, actually, and um, I spent the last 20 years before starting Distorted working uh, in and around various radio stations, commercial, BBC, um, up and down the country. And in 2015, decided to go and take a leap of faith to set up Distorted, thinking, you know what, radio is good and everything, but this whole world of like on-demand audio saw a bit of an opening there. And... I think probably more fluke than design. <laughs> um, uh, it's been a whirlwind ever since. And podcasting has absolutely exploded. And it has created an entire business for myself and our company. And there's 14 people that work for it now. Um, and it's sort of democratized audio, as I like to call it. And it's put the power of audio creators into their own hands to go and create content and find an audience for it, really. Um, and so that is what my company does now. I think we, um, since we got ahead of marketing, uh, we've just decided to rebrand our core tip company as an audio first agency because we still do make radio programs and radio documentaries for more sort of linear formats, but podcasting is 90% of what we do now. And is it the, the immediacy, the... the, the I want to listen to it now um, factor that's effective about podcasts. Yeah, I think that is definitely one element of it. Um, I think um, we've seen a lot of celebrity podcasts that have been a quite a sort of uh, a catalyst for how popular they're becoming. And I think like Twitter, like social media where you can go on and you can say oh like you know that person that famous person has just tweeted this that immediacy of that and it's sort of behind the scenes podcasting is there in, it's done in a similar way in the sense that these podcasts are very raw warts and all for the most part discussions storytelling um and they are far more raw than radio it doesn't mean they can't be professional and polished but they are a far more raw product. And I think pe that's what people enjoy and that's what people like. They feel like they're getting that one-on-one -on -one time with someone who they enjoy uh, in other parts of, the world, uh, the, of their sort of media cycle. And I suppose the other big difference with a radio program is that a podcast can be three minutes long or it can be an hour and a half. It, it, yes. You, know, you, you, you tailor the, 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 the length of the podcast to the effect you want to have yeah that's it exactly and I think from my with my radio hat on from a previous life that used to be the bane of the life in terms of fitting clocks and having to right we've got to have this show and it's got to be exactly 47 minutes because we've got 13 minutes of adverts or it's got to be this amount and yeah it's as long as it needs to be or it's as short as it needs to be but what I would say and we might get onto this is that that podcasting you know is long form co content now yeah. and long form content in today's landscape of media maybe anything greater than about three minutes but but that is long form content and i think that's where there's a you can create real lo loyal fans and followers because there's some real you know engaged listening if you can get it right yeah that's that that's interesting so is that why it's effective because it creates that that strong sense of engagement yeah I think totally and also I think the other thing is that I think there's stats released by um, there's a, a study from um, Ofcom they do a Midas report every year looking at like the state of audio in this country and I think it's somewhere in the 90% of people listening to podcasts listen alone and on headphones so it is a very very personal experience 
I know I listen when I'm taking the dog around the park. There so, we go, that's it. You know, I'm, I'm absolutely banging the centre of the statistics. Um, so what makes a good podcast? What, what are the key elements? True. Um, and I think we are still yet to learn all the different ways. Um, I think if we look at what has been popular and what is popular, you could say the celebrity or a another one-on-one or one-on-two interview podcasts having a sort of no holds barred candid conversation with someone that isn't prepped that doesn't have the constraints of broadcast media and you can get to the crux of of maybe difficult talking points interesting talking points entertaining talking points it's definitely been a very popular format and if you look at the top 100 podcasts you'll see that a large proportion of those are those sort of celebrity one-on-one type interview podcasts i think the other the other few I'd mention is true crime. I think there's, I think the fact that serial kicked everything off um, in terms of making podcasting famous, at least, um, and true crime has just gone on from strength to strength. And again, it is one of the most popular formats of a, for a podcast. I think partly is because audio is just such a good storytelling medium, and sound from sound design, music um, to really interested, engaging, thought-provoking analysis and narration um, just fit that true crime format so so well um, and then I guess uh, the final thing I'd say is probably the, the more um, the day-to-day news agenda and again be it from podcasts like the news agents to uh, Brexit cast you know America to, to these these types of podcasts that can comment daily you know like a breakfast magazine show but actually do it in a way that is again i'll go back to it doesn't have the constraints of broadcast media and can do it in a different different format be far more real less polished and um and therefore ask that maybe sometimes the tough questions and again yeah my, it comes back to my earlier point that you you set your own timeline yeah yeah you aren't worried about um well you know this interview the the eight ten interview on the today program it's going really really well but i've got to stop it because at 8.25, we've got to talk about the cricket. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Um, and then, but, but then I think the flip side of that is that there is a danger that you can, because you can, you shouldn't necessarily <laughs> do that. <laughs> um, and I think that's when I think the edit and how podcasting, podcasts are shaped and, and, uh, is, is just as important. That's, that's an important point. That's, that's very interesting that, that um, although it is raw and it's personality led still has to be under the creative control of a producer and there's still got to be editing involved completely um i think yeah there's a danger there with podcasting is that you're like we've got such creative freedom to do what we want that there's a three hour sort of diatribe on you know whatever the topic is and that yeah it isn't engaging it doesn't play to all podcasting strength so i think there's still it can be raw but it still needs to have a really clear objective it you know it needs to have a rough sort of target to aim for in terms of duration and then the topics covered um and an editor needs to have a really close eye on exactly what they are editing for and what content they are and that you know our, our company we 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 have a, <laughs> a saying in the office which is not ours, but you know, you don't miss what you don't hear, yes. <laughs> and 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 that is very very important. Even with very good content, is that how do you make sure that you are giving the listener what they expect? And I think that's um, that's really important. Put yeah. really important. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, we blithely use this term podcasts, um, and if you're very old, you will remember a device called the iPod, which is where the name came from. So it started out as something that you could deliver to iPods. Other MP3 players are available. Um, Now we are seeing video becoming part of what was designed to be an audio medium. How does that fit in and what does it bring to the party? So it's an interesting one and depending on who you speak to. So if you are a hardcore podcast sort of originalist, you'll say that video in podcast, there is no place for it. (laughs) Um, But to give you a bit of a backstory, the reason why video first started making an appearance was because podcasting suffers from, and it still does, 
a discoverability problem. So there are millions and millions of podcasts. I think 100,000 new podcasts get added to the Apple podcast store you know, every month. But how do you find them? And, and yes, you can be a hobbyist and you're happy just telling your five friends that I've got a podcast and those five people will listen. But how do you actually encourage good content to get found? And that is a real struggle and something that hasn't been cracked yet. And unlike YouTube with video content and other platforms where algorithms serve you up content based on what your history is, podcasting doesn't have that or it's just beginning to have that. So for the past, let's call it the past 10 years of podcasts start, starting to sort of be in popular culture and, and being people's mindsets in terms of something that they'd like to go and listen to, video has been a way to help shout about your podcast. And that started off with maybe the podcast logo, and we've probably all seen this, uh, a clip from the episode, something interesting. It's transcribed, there's a bouncing waveform, and that was a way to then say, oh, I can get this audio content and I can put it elsewhere and I can shout about what I'm doing. Um, and then that evolved and it was like, well, actually, that's pretty dull. It's pretty boring. I don't really want to see that. There's nothing really, it might catch my eye because there's some movement, but actually, I, there's nothing there. And social media platforms do not share audio well. Like, ah. like every platform has tried, you know, Twitter spaces, um, like Facebook, like uh, 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 dabbled in terms of creating sort of audio rooms. Um, there have been apps that have come and gone to try and create um, Clubhouse, um, share audio easily, but none have succeeded. And I think that goes down to maybe a bit of human nature in terms of what we expect in our social media apps is that we expect something visual to grab us because, you know what, as much as podcasting is one-on-one -on -one and it's personal with our headphones in, when we are doom scrolling for want of a better word we don't want audio <laughs> we want to doom scroll in, in peace and quiet yeah. to see what's going on to then say ah okay let's see what's there so that's how it's evolved and that has evolved through the ages to from i think specifically through covid where people were recording remotely and it was very easy to record a webcam and those would be chopped up transcribed and changed into little clips but then the production quality has improved people have expected more and so we end up at a position now where video has started to become the new sort of sexy part of podcasting in some people's minds um, because it's allowed it to reach more destinations and help therefore grow that show and that content. But it's still, it's still visual radio, essentially. I mean, you're, you're not making YouTube videos, you're making something that is stimulating through its, its, its content, through the speech, through what you're talking about. Totally, totally. And I think, but this is where the, the, the lines become blurred about what is a podcast. And, and I think I would personally say, I would say podcasting, even though it was born out of being audio only content, I think you could actually put your finger on it now and say, it's a style of content. It's this sort of a freedom to do what you want to do in certain manner and to produce content um, in a very conversational storytelling way. Um, and I think the fact that we are moving towards video in a lot of podcasts shouldn't detract from it being still being a podcast. But some people would say, oh, that's a, that's, you're, creating, you know, you're creating television, you're, tra you're creating YouTube, you're creating so, uh, a different type of content. And that's, that's fine and that's all up for debate. So, you have built yourselves a dedicated studio yes. as part of your company. Why do you need a studio? Well, you know what, we, we had a studio. We had, we had a studio that we built about five years ago and it was essentially a radio studio. And that was, the reason for that was our clients needed somewhere to record and we wanted to provide them that space. So we've always been the sort of production house behind it, but we also wanted to be the studio side as well. And so we built something that looked very much like a radio studio, large mic arms, um, a sort of a stand up desk. We did have cameras in there, but they were more like webcams. And so we, we, tr we essentially mimicked that radio studio and that worked well. And I think that people expected oh, I'm going to go and record some audio. I know what 
a radio studio looks like they're similar and so a lot of it is playing into like from a client point of view is like well, what are they expecting here and and you know what what gives us a professional polish and so that was always the way and then then after covid well sorry during covid studio redundant and we did a lot of remote recording and the technology caught up there in terms of how do you record remotely audio video content in browser and you've seen you know from apps like squadcaster and riverside to even zoom how they start to like make it really easy to record slightly better quality audio and record the video feeds and independent tracks um so that actually did beckon in a certain element of video content um so fast forward to sort of back to normality and in the last 12 months as people are were more happy to say you know what i want to you know what Zoom, Riverside, Squadcast, all these apps, um, they're great, but I want to get back in person and I want to really up the production quality. And so our visual studio was born pretty much out of client feedback and our sort of like a, a finger in the air to what we felt like our clients were asking of us. And that then was audio visualized, which again is nothing new, radio studios do it. But the new side is this idea that a podcast studio doesn't have to look like a studio. And actually, the less it looks like a studio, the better. So you'll look at a lot of these very laid back fireside chat podcasting studios like we've built with ours. They look like someone's living room, actually. <laughs> They've a sofa, there's a coffee table, you know, the mics all of a sudden aren't on these giant a sort of boom mounted arms because you can't get great camera angles with that they're far more discreet they're low level um and actually throw out the idea of soundproofing god um <laughs> but bring in something that feels more welcoming and less scary and i think that that has definitely been part of i think our studio success is that when you are working with people who are not used to being broadcasters who are not used to that environment stepping into somewhere which feels like a studio environment can be a quite daunting daunting feeling so stepping in somewhere where it looks like your living room is actually like ah okay this feels nice i can have my cup of tea on my coffee table there might happen to be some cameras dotted around and some mics popping up from left and right but actually um it makes for a far more friendly experience and i think since we decided to do that and we invested heavily in our studio um not only financially is it paid for itself already, but actually we're feeling like we are providing what the, audi uh, what the sort of podcast, the creator audience want. We've got a short video clip, which um, is um, a trailer complete with outtakes um, of, of one of your productions, but it gives a good idea of what your studio yes. looks like. The Capsule In Conversation is back for a brand new season, and this time we mean business. We are taking back control of our health and well being with educational, insightful, and inspiring conversations with brilliant guests. Taking a deep dive into the things that concern you the most perimenopause, menopause, mental health, and more. This season, we will be myth busting it all whilst providing the vital information that you need to feel empowered to take control and live the life that you want to live. And the best thing, we're doing it together. With our social media channels, you have been more interactive than ever. So we are putting your questions to our experts and getting the answers that you want. Join us for our series launch episode with Dr. Naomi Potter on Sunday, the 9th of April. <laughs> Thank you. I think that very much plays to your point about people sitting there being comfortable. Um, but also it shows that, that it is a nice, it's a nice space. Um, what, of the, what about the technology behind it then? You're, you're producing something that, that looks good as well as sounds good. How do you do that with a, a very limited crew inevitably? Yeah, so I think when we set about designing the studio and one thing i'll caveat this whole conversation with is i feel slightly like an imposter here because my background <laughs> is in audio and we are 
we are not video professionals. And so we've had to sort of like upskill ourselves in this. So when we were looking to design the, the studio, it was very much how can we create a workflow that could churn through, say, eight clients and eight different recording sessions a day whilst and, and be run by one person. <laughs> and, and I think that, that was very much at the back of my mind. How can we make this easy to do? and not very intrusive. So the set was relatively e relatively easy to build. We've got some custom lighting in there. Um, we had a cut separate company come in and do that. Went out and bought some furniture. It was very bizarre. It felt like I was like sort of like <laughs> buying furniture for your house, but it wasn't. Um, and then we were looking at, right, okay, camera equipment, and we did not want to skimp on anything there. And there are lots of brands, there are lots of amazing camera companies that create brilliant products but I wanted to look at something that could be a production process and hence why we went with Black Magic actually because from their ATEM um, uh, switcher through to their, um, their Black Magic pocket cinema cameras through to DaVinci Resolve the way that everything was set up there I instantly just saw that we can make that work so easily so the way we run it is that everything we film we have three cameras that are on actually arms built into the wall so there are no tripods that become trip hazards because we don't have a huge huge space here and it also means that actually when people come in the cameras are sort of pushed back to to the wall of, to begin with so we give them their briefing we get them sat down and it and, it, and then it's sort of like then <laughs> the cameras have come out on the arms and then maybe they start to feel like oh actually we are getting filmed here um, and then, yeah, we, we get a 1080p feed and that's brilliant because that means that we can, from a production workflow, actually, I mean, the file size is still huge, but it's something that we can deliver to clients. And actually, most of our clients are totally happy with that 1080p and they don't need any more than that. But the fact that the switcher can control all the cameras for it, from in the studio, we can change any settings that we need to mid recording if we needed to, if we needed to change the gain or you know, if something was suddenly out of focus or someone moves back, we can tweak that and we're not having to start and stop and go out again. Um, and actually Black Magic just works so simply like that. And I get that they're, they're a sort of very high end brand and it was a bit of a steep learning curve because again, they are studio cameras. They aren't, you know, they don't have autofocus really in terms of in terms of maybe what you'd expect on certain other makes. Um, and yeah, it, it just worked absolutely seamlessly for us. And the ability to then record ISO files to, to if we need to dive into an edit, having a DaVinci Resolve timeline there to tweak and then export if we need to. And then actually, which we we have used a few times, the ability to then record 6K in camera and bring that and export it on a DaVinci Resolve file if we then want or a, a client needs that resolution for whatever reason. So it was all about that workflow and we do, we have, we are booked out solidly and we churn through people day in day out and some are our clients and so they are our sort of we run those sessions but some are people who just want a space to record they are sort of podcast or video content creators looking for somewhere to film high quality audio and video sounds terrific <laughs> we're nearly out of time sure what comes next what's the future of podcasting well yeah my view is video is very much here to stay and I don't think it, yet yeah, the lines are blurring with YouTube content, but I still think podcasts, they have, they have a feel in terms of how the content and the format are devised and implemented and how people go about a conversation that is very different to YouTube content. So I think, I also feel like the, the DSPs you know, from Spotify to Apple to, 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 to where people consume this content, they are doubling down on video as well because I think they realize that actually there's a hell of a lot of podca podcast content created week in, week out. If we can cr get video content from these people, we have more ways to sort of to maximize that content like YouTube do. And I think you've seen it with Spotify now creating like a, a, almost like a, a timeline, a feed of content that they couldn't do if it was just audio, they need those visual assets. So I think that is where the future of podcasting is going. But I also think from a creative point of view, true crime, interviews, celebs, 
they're just the sort of tip of the iceberg creatively, you know. Uh, and I think from audio dramas, from again making it more accessible for people to do, um, I'm excited for what that future of podcasting looks like. And I, just one last thing when I mentioned, loop back to the start where I said I think podcasting democratized audio, that is the really exciting part for me is still that I, I want it to be an open platform. I don't want big tech companies to come and take it. I don't want it to turn into a YouTube where there's one platform that you upload your content to and they have that control. Podcasting is very much an open system with everyone's content held on privately owned servers and you do not need a broadcaster and that's what I love about it. You know, 20 years ago, if you wanted to create a podcast, you had nowhere to put it. You had to have deep pockets to have a radio station. And now we have clients that have millions of listeners to their podcast month in, month out. And that is direct to fan and there's no broadcaster in the middle there. And I think that's the powerful part. Democratizing creativity is always a good thing to do. It, yes. Alex Jungius, thank you very oh, much thank indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>